Christmas season, tons of other things money could be used for, instead given to you. Bless the faith. Your word promises that hope does not go unrewarded. So Lord, we thank you for that. Hope does not disappoint in Christ. So we ask you to touch the sick. We ask you to deliver those that are oppressed. We ask you to protect and bless in Jesus' name. Lord, as our church is praying, we turn our attention to Jeremiah Tauba, Ron and Lauren's son. We ask you, Lord, to, through your grace, send a miracle that the baby's lung would inflate, that the fluid would drain out, that the infection would go, and, Lord, that the child would live. We ask in the name of Jesus, God, that the baby would live and not die. In Jesus' name, the baby will live and not die. Just say that with me in faith. In Jesus' name, the baby shall live and not die. One more time. In Jesus' name, the baby shall live and not die. Lord, we trust in you for a miracle. We thank you for it. Uh, Lord, we ask for your miracle of healing on Aggie, that the skin would close up. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that there's no necrosis, that it's not getting worse. Uh, but, Lord, uh, we ask that the wound would heal and it would improve and get better. Thank you for sparing your servant, Don. We ask you to continue to heal him and raise him up uh, in the hospital in Chula Vista. Uh, and now as we turn to your word, we ask for your grace and mercy to be poured out upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen? Okay, so um, turn with me to 1 Timothy. We have been talking about grace, the grace of God, that God, we can trust in that grace, that we can ask Him for blessings, we can ask Him for protection. And we believe that God gives it to us, not because of the way we live, not because of anything else, other than because He loves us so much. So the question needs to be raised, especially now during Christmas season, how do we respond to that grace? What do we do in response to this grace? And we found at the end of last week's study that God only is interested in two things. What are they? Love and faith. Everybody say love and faith. That's all. God wants you to love Him and God wants you to believe that He is, that He's a good God, that He rewards those who dil diligently seek Him. And in John chapter 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will do what I ask. This is the test of love. It's easy. How many know in a marriage setting, it's easy to say, I love you. Ad nauseum. Some guys, some women, they just over and over again. Oh, no, no, I love you. I know I love you. Oh, you know I love you. But, I cheated on you. But I hit you. But I continue to be abusive to you and the kids. But I continue to get drunk. But I continue to get high. But I continue to go down these paths that although I say I love you, what does the action show? Does the action show love? Does the action show concern? Does the action even show respect? So I ask you, if you have somebody who is saying they love you, but is treating you in this way, do you believe the profession of love? No. Any more than in the book of James it says, faith without works is dead. It doesn't mean that we're saved by works. It doesn't mean that doing the things that God wants us to do, the action of obedience is what saves. No, that's where some Christian applications and denominations get it wrong. God is a God who, according to Jeremiah 17.10, searches the mind and examines the heart to reward a man according to the conduct of his deeds. It's not what you're doing, Jessica. It's not what you're saying that God is rewarding. But He's looking in your mind. He's looking in your heart. And He's seeing that the reason you're saying yes to what God wants you to do, the reason you're saying no to the things that God wants you to not do, is because of your love and because of your faith. With that in mind, we take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. As we come to understand, we are in the middle of Christmas time. Christmas season. A time when the whole world switches over to a different application. And the whole world wants to observe supposed to be the birth of Christ, correct? But what are they actually observing? Well, let's talk about that in a minute. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 says, Have nothing to do. Say that with me. Have nothing to do. Have nothing 
to do with what? Godless myths and old wives' tales, but rather train yourself to be godly. Okay, now let's look in context. Remember, we're talking about grace, the grace of God, and how we want to respond to this grace. He loves us so much. He has saved us. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven our sins. Now he asks us in John chapter 15, Jesus talking, if you love me, you will do what I ask you. What does the word ask? 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7 says, has not, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives tales, but rather train yourself to be godly. What is a myth? What's a myth? Basically, when we say myth, what are we talking about? A myth is different from a fable. A fable is something that never purports to be true. For instance, Aesop taught fables, right? And one of the famous Aesop's fables is of the fox. He's in the vineyard, and there's a lemon tree, and there's a, a vines there. And the fox tries to reach up to the grapes, which look very good, but he can't get to the grapes. Meanwhile, lemons fall from the tree onto the ground, and that's all the fox can eat is just the lemons. So he tells himself, oh, those grapes that I can't reach, they must be sour. They must be terrible. They must be the worst grapes in the world. Meanwhile, these lemons that I can get to, oh, these are the sweetest lemons I've ever had. These are great. And that's where we get the concept of sour grapes and sweet lemons. We try to tell ourselves something that is junk is good when it isn't, and we try to uh, 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 decry things that are good when they're not because we can't have them. But that's a fable. Nobody ever purports or says that there was a real fox who really did this. It's just a lesson that's trying to be taught by an imaginary creature and an imaginary story. So that's a fable. A myth, however, is different. A myth is something that society purports and tries to present is true, is real, tries to get its culture to believe it, tries to get its children to believe it, tries with song, with story, to turn something that should be a fable into an actual myth, presenting it as something that is true. Now, godless means that you take theos, you take kurie, you take the Lord, you take the God, you take Jesus, you take the Father, out of it. Instead, replace it with some other magical form of sorcery or wizardry or uh, 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 occult power that causes magical things to happen. That's a godless myth. Now, within the context of Christmas, as we've discussed in past years, what are some of the godless myths? What's the biggest one that's out there? The biggest godless myth that pertains to Christmas? Santa. Okay. Is that a myth? Heck yeah, it's a myth. That's not a fable. Society presents it as something that is true and that it is real. By what power does he fly? Is this God? Is it the Holy Spirit that holds him up? Is he being translated? Is he being raptured? No. He flies with a magic, uh, magic uh, reindeer. He has elves. There's a snowman that comes alive when you ram a corncob pipe into its head. All kidding aside, and these, imageries, these images are very cute. Is this a godless myth or not? Does that have anything to do with the Lord? No. Does it have anything to do with Jesus? No. Let's talk about that. Rather, godless, that's taking God out of it and creating a mythology. Let's talk about what is godly. Train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. What are godly aspects of Christmas? Well, who should it center on? Who? Jesus. Oh, look, right away we have a problem. We have one personality versus another personality. What scenery should it focus upon? The nativity. Who was there? Angels. Shepherds. Were the wise men there? No. Actually, history tells us, and so does Scripture, that the Magi came possibly a year, possibly two years after that. So, by the way, just in terms of 
uh, theological meticulousness, which I happen to be somebody that's like that. If you see a nativity scene that has a wise man, take the wise man out because the wise man actually didn't show up for a year or two. But anyway, because I just like scripture. But anyway, this is the components of a godly Christmas. To remind everybody that it's about Jesus, it's about nativity, and angels. These are godless myths, and that's the part of a godless Christmas. Now, again, let's look at what 1 Timothy 4, 7 says. Have nothing to do with. Now, you are going to have to decide for yourself what that phrase, have nothing to do with, means. Now, for me, it shouldn't take a big, huge Greek exegesis exercise to explain and express what have nothing to do with means. As a matter of fact, this passage in 1 Timothy 4 goes on to say people who do these things have nothing to do with those people. Have nothing to do with godless myths. Rather, train yourself to be godly. If this scripture is true, what we as believers are supposed to do is not only completely eliminate the godless portions of our celebration to be pleasing to the Lord and to basically show Him love and do what He asks, but we are supposed to train and emphasize those things that are godly. Focusing on Jesus and focusing on those things. Is this reasonable? The problem Go ahead, you can say it. Kids. The cakey, what about that? Because if you impose this scripture on kids, and now kids are not supposed to sit on Santa's lap, and now kids are not supposed to watch Frosty, now kids are supposed to be careful about what they wear, what they do, what kind of things they are taught to believe in and apply themselves to. Well, now this is not, this is me. That's why on Facebook I put that picture of John McEnroe. You know, you've got to be kidding me. You have any idea what our children go through and how they're going to react if I try to impose this on them, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. I know exactly what I'm asking you guys to do. And here's the thing, I'm not the one who's asking. Got it. The season is supposed to be about Jesus. The nativity is important because, Micah, this shows that God is faithful. This shows that God will do what He says He's going to do. That He takes a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, segregates that trinity, sends His Son Jesus to earth, just like He promised He would, where Jesus walks and ministers for 33 and a half years, suffers and dies on the cross, and the Father lets Him. Talk about a parent who allows a child to go through a hard time. Imagine having the eternal power to say, Stop this suffering. Stop this torment. Stop this torture on my son. I don't care what happens to anybody else because my kid comes first. Instead, God says no. For mankind and for my purposes, I'm going to allow this to happen. All that grace, all that mercy, all that love lavished upon us. And the whole crux of it, Richard, is the nativity. There's the baby. There's the proof that God will do what He says. If you believe that baby actually came and that God actually comes through with what He promises, you can believe Romans 8.28. All things will work together for good for you. You can have trust that when you die, there is eternal life. There is heaven waiting. There is the kindness of God. And all these things that we have done and all these ways we have erred and offended God as we tremble and as we think, oh gosh, is he going to bring up this or bring up that? And there's God sitting on the throne and they open the book of your life to take a look at every mistake you made. All he's going to see is red. The blood of Jesus covering everything. We remember it, but he has now forgotten because it's covered under the blood. 
Your friends may remind you of it constantly. They may torment you with the memory of the mistakes you have made and make you pay and pay and pay. But God, the final judge in your life, He forgets it all. It's not there. And God's opinion of us is really, at the end of the day, the only one we have to be concerned with. It is this grace, it's this mercy, it's this power that is contained within who Jesus is and the nativity and the angelic presence that was there to turn that into this? Jesus says this about all that. And I want you to turn with me very briefly in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, he is talking to his apostles and he is discussing with them how difficult it is to stand up for God. How difficult are we finding it these days to stand up for Jesus? Harder and harder, amen? Well, if you think it was, it's hard for us now, but it was easy for them back then. Back then, you got crucified for opposing the gods of Rome. Your children would die for doing this. Children were martyred just like adults were martyred. And within this context of people standing up for God and standing up for Jesus, in a horrible culture that was deadly, not just socially adversarial, Elder, I'm talking about your life is in danger. And your children's lives are in danger. Your sons and your daughters and your nephews and your nieces and your grandchildren could all be killed. This level of danger is what Jesus is speaking to. So obviously, what you and I experience in terms of cultural pressure is nothing compared to what Jesus was speaking to within the context of Matthew 10, starting with verse 32. He says, Whosoever shall confess me before men, I will confess before my Father. However... Whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father. Again, who's he talking to? He's talking to his apostles. These are some of the holiest men in the world. We know they're saved. How, Marilyn? Their names are on the foundation of New Jerusalem, the holy city. We know they are there. Book of Revelation says the apostles of the Lamb are there. And yet to these very men, he says... If you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my Father. But if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. Well, let's take a look at these two words for just a second. What does the word confess mean? Homologesi is the Greek word used here, and its parsing is future indicative active. This means, Lache, if you do this, this will happen. Okay? If I throw this pen, it will land on the floor. If I hold my breath, I will pass out. If I set this chair on fire, it will be ruined. Future, indicative, active. This is going to happen if you do this. It is a natural and or supernatural consequence. Well, here Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, who is you're going to be your eternal judge. Confess means we agree with what is said. God says it, I agree with it. The word homologia also means profess. Confess, profess, and praise are actually the three words it means. Confess, profess, and praise. To confess means I agree with God. I know what God says and I agree with it. Profess means now this is how I apply it and this is how I feel about it. Confession. I believe that Christmas has to do with Jesus, nativity, the angels, and it doesn't have anything to do with this. That's what the Bible says. Profession, and I believe it. I want to emphasize Jesus, and I want to eliminate everything that God wants me to eliminate in my life. How many believe that God wants us to eliminate drunkenness in our life? Say amen. This is in the same category. To God... You want to stay a drunk and you see somebody who remains a drunk in deference to what the Word of God says and you go, oh, that person doesn't really love Jesus. Oh, that person is, is rebelling against the Word of God. Well, guess what? Anybody who remains within this context is in the same category. 
resistant because they just want it. They've built up a rationalization in their head where they just got to have it and there's nothing wrong with it. I may have heard a drunk talk like that before. There's nothing wrong with it. It's no big deal. I'm not hurting anybody. Same thing you hear about this. It's no big deal. It's not hurting anybody except one person. Who? who he who has said have nothing to do with this stuff. Now look. Confess. This is what God says. And I agree with it. This is how I feel about it. Praise I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about the proof of His faith and faithfulness in the nativity. I want to talk about how all the angels of heaven and all the power of heaven and glory is backed, has, has, has backed what God has done here. Don't talk to me about this. Don't bring that up. Don't touch my kid with this stuff. This is so not what it's all about. Deny? What does deny mean? Now see, here's the thing. Everybody hears the word deny, and they think the word deny, Sandra, means actually coming out and saying, oh, no, 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 I don't believe what the Word of God says. I don't believe that. Uh, you know, I, I mean, God knows that, you know, I, I don't believe like this. God knows my kids know this isn't real. So it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's still a godless myth. Oh, no, 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 Pastor, you don't understand. You know, for my family, it's just part of our family tradition. We don't do it as a religion. It's just part of who we are. Well, there are a ton of things that are part of who I was, who, the, who you are, that we give up for the sake of the Lord. Can I hear an amen? What did he give up in terms of who he was for you and I? To deny not only means to actively say something is not right, but the word ar ne setai, which is also future active indicative, means to not affirm. Everybody say that with me, not affirm. What does that mean, not affirm? Okay. Say we're all in a big giant crowd. And somebody says, who's a pastor of Calvary Church of the Island? And I wave, wave, wave my hand and say, yes, me. I am the pastor of Calvary Church of the Islands. I have a bunch of the people in our church here. Uh, guys, can you uh, wave your hand and say, yes, that's our pastor? Let's say you guys stand there like this. Every one of you just stands there like this. Okay, now stop and think. You didn't say anything against me. You didn't say, no, 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 that's not the pastor of Calvary Church. No, no, that's not my pastor. You didn't say anything active like that. But by the same token, you said nothing when I was looking for somebody to stand up for me. According to exegesis of Greek, the word that Jesus used, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. According to the word that Jesus used, that's what it means. If people emphasize Christmas is all about this and you just stand there and say nothing, well, I'm not going to get into it now. I don't want to push my religion on anybody. If that's where you stay, by definition, I can't change it for you. You are denying Jesus. If I could rationalize it for you, if I could soften this blow, if I could tell you that it's perfectly okay for you to continue with what you're doing, I would. Believe me. If I was God, the whole universe would be different. Of course, every woman here would be blonde, too, but nonetheless. And you could eat all you want, and nobody could ever gain weight, and animals would live forever, especially dogs. Cats, yeah, there might be a shelf life. But see, that's the world, it would, there, that's the world we would be in if I was God. I'm not God. You guys should say praise the Lord for that, by the way. Can I give you a, a cute little tidbit that follows that up? You're not God either. Who do you think you are to decide where and when Scripture gets applied and where and when it's okay? Who do you think you are to tell God, here, you're just going to have to live with it. And here, yes, absolutely, I'm going to pound that one. Yeah, my wife gets drunk all the time, so yeah, hammer on that one. Yeah, my husband watches porn, so yeah, hammer on that one. This one, ah. God's not like that. And as your pastor, I can't tell you he is. Numbers chapter 30, and we don't have time to go into a big study there, but Numbers chapter 30 says something really alarming. 
it pre presents Micah a spiritual found principle. And what it says is this. Talk about vows. The context is vows. It's things that we promise God. And basically what Numbers chapter 30 says is, if you hear somebody make a vow, and you say nothing, that vow stands. In fact, Numbers 30 says, if he vows something and I say nothing, I confirm that vow. You got people around you telling you Jesus does not exist, God is dead, and you say nothing, you confirm. This is the way God sees things. You confirm it. How many of you guys have heard, had lies told you about, about you? Say amen. How many have lies being told about you right now? How does it make you feel? When the lies get told to friends, and they just don't want to get into it, so they don't say anything. No, no, I'm not going to get involved. You know, let them say any kind, and it, I, it's just not my thing, so go on. Hurts you, doesn't it? And what value do, do you place on that one friend who, when lies are told about you, goes, hey, talk about my friend like that. That is not true. That's, that's a lie right there. And I'm not going to let you stand in front of all these guys and tell them all this she buy when it's not true. How do you value that one friend? What does it say to you about their love for you? This is what God's looking for, is love. It's not, it's not the, the, the concept or principle itself. It's the application of love. We started with the question, this grace that God gives us, how do we respond to it? But again, in the end, we have the same problem for the kids. And over the years, as I've talked to parents about the application of Jesus into Christmas and the elimination of everything else, these are the top three things I have heard. Number one, you're stealing their happiness. Have you ever seen, Pastor, how happy a child is sitting on Santa's lap? Have you ever seen, Pastor, the child's joy when you give them a gift on, on Christmas morning it says from Santa? Have you ever seen how happy they are when they're singing the songs? I think it's a creepy song myself. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. This is a big, fat, holy guy who knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. And he knows if you've been bad or good. Who the heck are you to decide if this is good or bad? So be good for goodness sake. Not God's, not scriptures, goodness' sake. Who's goodness and how do I serve that? Stealing happiness. Number two, I don't want my child to be different. All the other kids get to do this. All the other kids get to be in the Christmas play. All the other kids get to do this. And they get to have Santa on their t-shirts. And they get to go to school with the little elf hat. And they get to do all this stuff. And I don't want my kids to be any different. It's too much pressure for them. I don't want to put that. You ready for the big lie? Here it comes. I don't want to make that choice for them. They're only small. I'm going to let them decide on their own later. For now, I will let my witness be what speaks. Because they're going to see me and they're going to think, Oh, wow, he's so holy and he's so perfect. Shoot, I want to be like him. Really? Seriously, I don't think so. Okay? They are going to be different. But if you don't mind me telling you, our kids are supposed to be different. Our kids are supposed to stand up for something. Number three, if I do this and I exclude all this stuff from my kids and, and our household and I go home after this message and I pray the prayer and everything related to this is going to be thrown out of my house, my kid will hate me. Kid? Hate me. And as a result, 
he will hate God. Because he'll remember that God is the one who told me, I can't have this and I can't have that and i got to be different. I hate being Christian. I hate going to church. I hate Pastor Wendell. I hate all this stuff. Well, i got plenty of people hating me, so I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. But if you hate Jesus, you've got a major problem. First of all, for me, you're placing happiness with joy. This is carnal, temporal, generated stuff. The joy of the Lord is my strength, and we need to teach our children at the earliest possible age how to, how to cultivate this joy and be happy with knowing God is happy with you when you reject this stuff. Number two, we are called to be different. We are supposed to, according to the book of Proverbs, train our children up to be godly. Ooh, look, that ties in with what this says. Train our children up. Who's supposed to train our children up? We are. We are supposed to pay the price and train our children up to be godly. And part of being godly is having nothing to do with godless myth, but instead training ourselves to immerse ourselves in what is godly. Three, the kid will hate you and will hate God. Much depends on how you present it. But at the end of the day, if standing up for the Lord is going to make them turn from God and hate God, Eventually, you're going to hate God anyway. Better to be honest with them. So what happens to a kid that is raised like this? Are they denied stuff? Are they joyless? Do they turn out to be drug addicts because they're taught, you know, that they have to reject all this worldly stuff? Well, fortunately, and we have a couple minutes, maybe three, we have a child here in this church that has been raised completely 100% without any of this stuff. Who was told from the time he was a zygote? That's Santa. We, we actually call it Satan Claus in our, in our house. And Rudolph, this flying dog, is actually uh, occultically powered. These elves are, are, are horrible things, and they're actually demons in disguise. Uh, Frosty is, is, is animated by witchcraft, uh, and you can hear the demons cackling in the air. as he, he and, and this is the way this kid was raised. By the same token, this kid was taught to look to only Jesus and these things during Christmas time. And there he sits. So I'm going to ask Joshua, and actually, Joshua, you need to use that microphone. Thank you. I want Joshua to just talk to you for a minute about what it was like from the time he was smaller than this Kleenex box to this. What it was like to be raised as a child this way. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about being the size of the Kleenex box, but I can't talk about being a kid. I remember because I used to talk to you all the time. When and you were just that so big. you guys know, it's true. We really do call him Satan Claus at home. It's not, he's Amen. not joking around. Um, but growing up in that mindset, it wasn't like um, I was being, having my happiness stolen from me. It was no such thing. I mean, um, a child raising that, he's perfectly happy with knowing that Jesus loves him, and that was. God's gift to the world during that time and the nativity and all that. I mean, it has a holiday cheer of its own, and it's the correct one. No, oh, that's what's fucked on. Okay. As for being different, um, it's true. They, you do feel different, but um, being raised on the joy of the Lord, you know, that difference becomes a blessing to you. Uh, so, I think in that way, different in a good, is in a good thing. And really, uh, when I was thinking about the way uh, things were in school, I was thinking about uh, who would have issue with me not believing in Santa. I was thinking about it, and really, those kinds of people who would be against uh, you believing in this and not that are the kind of people who you have to be going up against in pretty much everything. Uh, it's not just Santa. It's Halloween. It's Easter, the Easter Bunny. It's all of it. And so, really, the question of whether you want your kid to be different is uh, whether you want your child to stand up for righteousness or not. That's what I thought that I was uh, hearing when I was thinking about it between services. And so, lastly, um, kids hating uh, their parents or hating God. Um, well, as you can see, you know, me and Dad, you know, hate each other profusely. Totally. You know, totally hate each other. No, no. Me and Dad have a wonderful relationship. I love God. I love him. I love my stepmom and my mom. You know, uh, 
I, I think that I actually appreciate them even more for raising me correctly like this. So uh, those are the three points. Any questions? No? You guys have children. You guys have grandchildren. Any questions you want to ask Josh about what he had to go through or the quote-unquote price he had to pay for uh, his mother and I being so pedantic about this? Yes. What did I do when I was in a school situation and they were having like a Christmassy time play with like the Santa and Rudolph and that? Um, I would really not do it. Like for instance, if like we're singing a song, I would kind of like, mm -hmm, not really sing. Just, you know, um, not performing or not getting myself involved in that. Any more, anything else? Yes, Kalai. So Lizzie is telling people that Satan, or Santa is Satan. She definitely comes to this church. You understand where that comes from, right? The Bible says in three different places that gods of the pagan nations are demons. The gods of the pagan nations are demons. It's a small g there. So it meant, it's meant to be a being that possesses magical or supernatural power, calling themselves what they would term, we would call it a superhero, they would call it a god, but those of the pagan nations, they're demons. He was different, but here's the thing. Holy is different. If you are holy, you are different. Thank you, son. You can have a seat. The book of First Peter, give him a hand. The book of First Peter says that when we do not plunge ourselves into the dissipation and sin that the world does, the world thinks we are aliens. The world thinks we are crazy, and they don't understand why we, they, we, we don't join in with them. We don't join with them because we're different. And he may have been inconvenienced when he was a child, but now at 21 years old, he has more respect for me and his mother because we took a stand for the Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and I'm going to shut my eyes. In fact, I'll turn my back because this is something between you and God. I'm just going to look at the cross, and you look at the cross too. Joshua was asked, not this Joshua, but Moses' Joshua, to be strong and courageous in the face of advers uh, adversity. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So during this Christmas season, in response to God's grace, I'm just going to invite you to lift your hand and just say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One more time, you tell it to the Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God, you have been so gracious to us. You've been so loving to us. It's not that we're afraid you're going to punish us. It's not, a, it's not that we're afraid that you're going to throw lightning bolts at us. We have a godly fear that you're going to be hurt if we don't stand up for you in the middle of a world that is turned against you. Count on me, God to speak up and raise my household in godliness. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen? amen. All right, I want to thank you for coming. Remember, Wednesday night, uh, we're going to get together and we're going to have just worship and praise and uh, communion. And then uh, we'll have a little soiree after that. But if you're busy, we understand some of you are going to have to bounce. Somebody say praise the Lord. All right, thanks for coming.